Welcome to the Tim Booker book sharing channel. Like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss our updates. Let's explore the world of books together. Today, I will interpret mixed signals for you with the subtitle How Incentives Work. What is mixed signals? Let's start with a story that happened to the author of this book, Professor Yuri Nitz at the University of California, San Diego. The author has a son named Ron. One day, he took Ron to Disneyland. While waiting in line to buy tickets, the sign read, under three years old, free. When it was their turn to pay, the ticket seller asked how old the child was. The author said, almost three. However, Ron had actually turned three a few months earlier. After entering Disneyland, Ron said, Dad, I don't understand. You told me that only bad people lie, but you just lied. So what Ron received from his father was two conflicting signals. This is what mixed signals are, saying one thing but doing another. Later, when the author and Ron reached another attraction, a sign at the entrance stated, must be four years old to play. Ron then said, I just turned four. Clearly, in the father's words and actions, Ron had already made a choice. In many organizations, a similar situation exists. What is said doesn't align with what is done. Saying is easy to understand. It's what the organization advocates. But what about doing? It mainly refers to what the organization incentivizes, such as rewarding, punishing, and assessing. If an organization advocates one dimension but actually incentivizes another, it sends mixed signals. For example, emphasizing quality but incentivizing quantity, encouraging teamwork but incentivizing individual success, promoting innovation and risk-taking but punishing failure, and so on. These are all examples of releasing mixed signals. And these mixed signals can lead to the failure of what you truly want to promote. In this book, the author discusses how to resolve these mixed signals and how to better design incentive measures to maximize their effectiveness helping the development of businesses and the cultivation of good personal habits. Now, let's look at some mixed signals and how they can be resolved. You can listen and reflect on whether you have encountered similar situations around you. Let's first look at the first common mixed signal, emphasizing quality but incentivizing quantity. Now, listen to two real stories. The first story was shared by an economics professor who wanted his younger son to learn to use the toilet. He told his five-year-old daughter that she would be rewarded with a candy for each time she helped her younger brother use the toilet. The daughter, however, figured out a trick. In her own words, she said, I found that if he drinks more, he uses the toilet more. So, I kept giving water to my brother continuously. The second story took place in China. Paleontologists recruited local farmers to search for fossils at a dig site and rewarded them based on the fragments they submitted. Some farmers started smashing the discovered bone fossils to increase the quantity and consequently their income, greatly diminishing the scientific value of the artifacts. Both stories share a common point. The intention behind the incentives was good, but by setting a single quantity incentive metric, things turned worse. Similar situations exist in organizations. For instance, here are real examples the author came across. A glass factory measured production solely by the area of glass produced, resulting in increasingly thin and fragile glass. A customer service center rewarded bonuses based on the number of calls handled, leading to careless handling of issues as agents aim to quickly move on to the next call. A ride-sharing company tied driver compensation to the number of accepted orders, resulting in poor service quality and unsatisfied users. These are all outcomes of setting incentives solely related to quantity, sacrifice, and quality. There is also an extreme example from Wells Fargo Bank in the U.S., in 1997, the CEO initiated a campaign to make each customer have an average of eight bank products. Employees exceeding the sales target were eligible for salary increases or promotions. While this seemed like a direct and effective incentive, the target was nearly impossible to achieve. To keep their jobs, employees resorted to cheating. For many years, some Wells Fargo employees' daily routine involved coming to the office, having coffee, turning on the computer, and then creating and managing fake accounts. They opened unauthorized accounts, issued fake credit cards, and sold unnecessary insurance products to unknowing customers. When exposed in 2016, the number of fake accounts reached 3.5 million, and 5,300 employees were fired for fraudulent activities. Why did these employees resort to cheating? It was because the company's incentive measures signaled that sales quantity was paramount, overshadowing everything else. Wells Fargo paid a heavy price for this, with a tarnished reputation that is yet to fully recover. The author presents these examples to remind us that if you value quality, never incentivize only quantity. When setting a quantity incentive metric, you must consider potential side effects and introduce an additional incentive dimension to ensure quality. Yes, that's the solution to such mixed signals, adding an incentive dimension. For example, in the case of the bank mentioned earlier, 
introducing internal control audit mechanisms to penalize violations, in the case of the glass factory, implementing a quality inspection mechanism to penalize substandard products. Additionally, commonly seen evaluations for customer service and anonymous ratings for ride-sharing drivers and couriers are supplementary incentive dimensions. The approach of adding an incentive dimension can also be used to resolve another type of mixed signal, emphasizing team cooperation but incentivizing individual success. Individual incentives are common in organizations, linking bonuses and rewards to individual performance. While this can motivate members to work harder, if the organization also values teamwork, and many tasks require collaborative efforts, solely incentivizing individual success can have numerous drawbacks. It may lead to internal competition and conflicts within the team during collaborative projects. Furthermore, in organizations that solely emphasize individual incentives, senior members may be reluctant to mentor new members, as it takes time and may create potential competitors. So, how can this issue be resolved? Let's use an example from a soccer team to illustrate. Imagine you are a star player on a soccer team, dribbling towards the opponent's goal. Facing two defenders, you need to decide whether to take the shot yourself or pass the ball to a teammate. Now, let's hit the pause button and analyze the situation. Based on your experience, you estimate a 40% chance of scoring if you take the shot yourself and a 60% chance of scoring if you pass the ball to your teammate. How would you decide in this situation? Would you directly choose the option with the higher probability? Not necessarily. Your decision depends on the expected return of each option. How do you calculate the expected return? It's simple. Assuming your team rewards a bonus of $10,000 for individual goals, representing individual incentive, and $3,000 for assisting others' goals, representing cooperation incentive. In this scenario, the expected return of taking the shot yourself is $10,000 multiplied by a 40% success rate, resulting in $4,000, passing the ball to your teammate. The expected return is $3,000 multiplied by a 60% success rate, resulting in $1,800. Therefore, your rational choice in this moment would be to take the shot yourself, even if the success rate is lower. However, from the team's perspective, your thought process would clearly harm the overall interests of the team. The key issue lies in the fact that cooperation incentives are insufficient compared to individual incentives. An immediate solution is to reduce the bonus for individual goals or increase the bonus for assisting goals. Alternatively, introducing a significant team award, where each team member receives a substantial bonus if the team wins, would make players prioritize cooperation. This principle applies in other organizations as well. If you want members to exert individual effort while not damaging team cooperation, you cannot neglect the incentive dimension of teamwork, in addition to individual incentives. Besides setting collective bonuses, another method is to establish separate awards for specific forms of collaboration, such as Best Partnership Award or Best Mentor Award. This can alleviate issues like internal competition and the lack of enthusiasm in mentoring mentioned earlier. Now let's examine another set of mixed signals, emphasizing innovation but punishing failure. For many companies, success hinges on innovation. However, innovation involves risks and risks are accompanied by failures. We know that Thomas Edison, in his quest to find the right filament for the light bulb, tried thousands of different materials. After trying over 2,000 without success, his assistant complained, all our efforts have been in vain. Edison responded, we have learned a lot. We now know over 2,000 materials that do not work. Later, Edison mentioned that they actually tried over 6,000 fibers before finally finding the right one. Edison's attitude towards failure was that it had meaning and was worthwhile. In the book, The Origins of Genius, author Simonton provides evidence that the most creative geniuses experience the highest number of failures. In other words, they are not more likely to succeed than ordinary people. They simply make more attempts. Similarly, the most innovative companies also have a high failure rate, but they fail faster, at a lower cost, and thus derive more lessons from setbacks compared to their competitors. However, many companies today encourage employees to innovate while simultaneously punishing them when their attempts at innovation or new projects fail, ranging from verbal criticism to affecting performance, delaying promotions, or even advising termination. This creates a mixed signal, leading to employees being afraid to try new ideas, hesitant to take on new projects, and unable to learn from failure. To address this mixed signal, the key lies in categorizing internal failures within the company. If failures result from malice, negligence, or incompetence, then appropriate punishment is justified. However, if failures stem from testing new ideas and directions, more tolerance and even encouragement should be provided. For example, the author mentions that the chairman of Tata Group, a giant in India, established the Dare to Try award for the most valuable failed innovations before his retirement stating that failure is a goldmine. 
The signal he conveyed was that in the pursuit of innovation, encouragement should be given regardless of success or failure. The author strongly agrees with organizational psychologist Bob Sutton's statement that companies should not punish failure but should punish inaction. Additionally, the book suggests another piece of advice. Companies should encourage rapid failure. Because the faster failure occurs, the earlier losses are mitigated and the experience iterates more quickly. However, embracing rapid failure or quickly admitting failure goes against human nature. Once people commit to something, they naturally hope to see it through and avoid failure. Even when failure becomes apparent, they may think, if I invest a bit more, if I try a bit harder, maybe I can turn things around. This is related to the psychological concept of loss aversion, where individuals are averse to realizing losses, similar to many people holding on to losing stocks, hoping that holding on longer might lead to a profit. In a company, if employees persist in trying to salvage projects with little hope, continuously investing resources, it can result in significant unnecessary losses for the company, even in environments that encourage innovation and failure. Therefore, the book suggests that to cultivate a positive company culture conducive to innovation, not only should risk-taking be embraced and the fear of failure reduced, but companies should also encourage rapid failure. In reality, many companies are already adopting such practices. For example, Alphabet, Google's parent company, encourages teams to develop creative ideas while also encouraging them to overturn their ideas as soon as evidence of failure emerges. After overturning, the company celebrates and individuals are often promoted and rewarded for cutting losses in a timely manner. Whether in a small team of two or a larger team of 30, as long as failure is terminated promptly, everyone receives rewards. Another example is Merck, a pharmaceutical technology company, where a research and development director introduced a project termination fee. The director noticed that some pharmaceutical researchers, to avoid failure, would persist in experimenting with a single approach. Therefore, the director decided to reward researchers who promptly terminated failed projects and shifted to new ideas. As a result, the speed of creative iteration in the company significantly increased. All right, just now we discussed some common mixed signals in organizations. You will find that to resolve mixed signals fundamentally, it is necessary to establish appropriate incentives. First, understand what you truly want to achieve in the organization, then tailor incentives accordingly to target it. Also, ensure that other incentivized metrics do not harm what you genuinely care about. However, for many managers, a more challenging problem is how to set effective incentives. They discover that many reward and punishment measures, when implemented, do not have much impact. Addressing this issue, based on classical theories in behavioral economics and the author's extensive practical experience over the years, the book provides some incentive catalysts to help make incentives more effective. The first of these incentive catalysts is called mental accounts. What does it mean? Let's illustrate with a simple example. Suppose you go to a physical store to buy a massage device priced at $200. The salesperson informs you that the same device is on promotion at a branch 20 minutes away, and you can get it for only $150. Would you drive there to save money? Most people would choose to go because the discount seems significant. Now, imagine you are buying a $5,000 computer, and the salesperson tells you that the same computer is selling for $4,950 at the branch 20 minutes away. Would you bother making the trip? Most people would not, as the discount appears minor and not worth the effort. However, the discount is still $50 in both cases. What changes is the position of this $50 in your mental account? Behavioral economics tells us that the human brain contains multiple mental accounts, such as housing, dining expenses, entertainment, education, and even more specific accounts like gaming, ski care, fuel costs, etc. Each account has its independent budget, some larger, some smaller. Every expense we incur is allocated to different mental accounts, for example, the money you spend on a massage device versus a computer would belong to two different mental accounts. The significance of the same amount of money varies depending on the specific mental account it falls under. Therefore, based on this principle, the author designed an incentive improvement strategy. Rather than implementing incentives broadly, focus on specific mental accounts that satisfy needs. What does this mean? Let's consider examples the author has practiced. For instance, there's a taxi company in Singapore where drivers sit for extended periods daily lacking physical activity, and facing a high risk of chronic diseases. The company wanted to incentivize drivers to exercise more and was willing to reward $100 to drivers meeting the exercise goal. The author proposed an improvement by not directly awarding $100 but concentrating on a more specific mental account, like offsetting some fees that drivers disliked. They discovered that taxi drivers renting company cars had to pay around $100 in rent daily, and drivers disliked this transaction 
finding it unpleasant to take out $100 from their pockets every day. Therefore, the author suggested using the $100 reward to waive a day's rent for those achieving the exercise goal. Later, to test the incentive effect, they divided drivers into two groups, one receiving direct cash and the other having rent deducted. They monitored the daily steps taken by drivers. After a month, they found that the group with rent deductions had more drivers meeting the exercise goal, with a higher average step count. Moreover, even after continuing the exercise incentives for four more months and then stopping, the group with rent deductions continued to have higher daily activity levels. All this indicated that the incentive approach targeting specific mental accounts was more effective. This incentive approach can also be applied in marketing promotions. For example, a car selling website decided to increase sales by offering a $450 reduction in purchase fees for everyone buying through the site. However, the impact on sales was minimal. The author suggested a modification, turning the $450 into a complimentary gas card bundled with the car, allowing owners to use it when refueling. The effect on sales significantly improved. Because $450, placed in the mental account of buying a car, seemed small compared to the total car cost, but if placed in the mental account of refueling, it represented a substantial amount, covering multiple refills. They even found that reducing the gas card amount to $250 still resulted in a better incentive effect than the $450 fee reduction. Additionally, the book mentions a real estate agency that gave buyers several thousand yuan in cash back after purchasing a house but had limited incentive impact. One of the author's colleagues had bought a house through this agency and vaguely recalled receiving a cash rebate but couldn't remember the specific amount. Compared to the house price, the cash back was too small, and she was busy dealing with a pile of loan-related documents at the time, burying the cashback contract among them. Many people had similar experiences to the author's colleague. Therefore, the author helped the agency improve the plan, changing the cashback into a deduction on new house decoration costs worth several thousand yuan. For example, within a few months of moving in, customers could receive substantial refunds when making purchases at local furniture stores, acquiring a lot of furniture with minimal spending. After this modification, home buyers love this rebate rule, bringing many new customers to the agency. So, the author reflects that sometimes when people implement an incentive measure and find it not very effective, they might draw the wrong conclusion that incentives are ineffective. However, from these examples, it can be observed that many times, it's not that incentives are ineffective, but the incentive posture is not right. Simple adjustments to the posture can significantly enhance effectiveness. In addressing incentive issues, the focus should not only be on whether to incentivize or what to incentivize, but also on how to incentivize to maximize efficiency. Just now, we talked about the incentive catalyst called mental accounts. Now, let's discuss another one, loss aversion. This is also a well-known theory in behavioral economics. In simple terms, the pain of loss is greater than the pleasure of gain. The pain of losing $200 is stronger than the joy of gaining $200. When applied to improving incentives, this principle can have an immediate and significant effect. Researchers once conducted an experiment at a high school in Chicago, USA. They told the teachers that if they were responsible for improving their students' final exam scores, they would receive a reward of $8,000. However, there were two reward schemes. For the first group of teachers, they would receive the money after the end of term exams. For the second group, they would receive $8,000 at the beginning of the semester, but if the student's performance did not improve by the end of the semester, they had to return the money. The result was that the second group of teachers, who had to return the money if they didn't achieve the goal, worked harder, and there was a more significant improvement in student performance. Clearly, people are willing to exert more effort to retain something they already have compared to striving for something they haven't gained yet. Therefore, in general, designing incentives based on potential loss rather than gain can make the same bonus more effective. The author also conducted an experiment in a Chinese company. The company planned to reward each team member with $80 for exceeding the production target every week. Upon the author's suggestion, they divided the workers into two groups. One group was the gain group, only eligible for the reward at the end of each week. The other group was the loss group, and they would receive $80 every Monday, but if the weekly production target was not met, the bonus would be deducted from their wages. The result was that the productivity of the loss group increased significantly more than that of the gain group. Therefore, the author suggests that, whenever possible, try to create a story about loss for the individuals you want to incentivize. That is, give them something and then let them know that they may lose it in the future. This narrative is much more effective than a simple story like, effort may lead to a reward. Now, let's look at another, incentive catalyst, regret aversion. This means that people, when making decisions, try to avoid future regrets. For example, the author mentions his grandfather, who used to buy a lottery ticket with the same number every week. 
This habit persisted for decades until his passing. Why? It was precisely because he didn't want to regret it. The grandfather was afraid that if he missed buying a ticket one week and that happened to be the week when his chosen numbers won, it would be a devastating blow, and he might regret it for the rest of his life. Faced with such a terrifying prospect of regret, the money spent on buying a lottery ticket every week was negligible. This mindset is shared by many people who buy lottery tickets. In incentive scenarios, this aversion to regret can also play a significant role. A few years ago, the author visited the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which wanted to encourage employees to drive less to work. They devised an incentive measure. Every day, employees who didn't drive to work would receive a $3 reward. The foundation found that they were spending $1,500 daily on the no-driving reward, and while the cost was not low, the incentive effect was not substantial. So, they consulted the author to see if a more effective solution could be designed, one that would make better use of the $1,500 daily expenditure. The author proposed an improvement based on regret aversion introducing a $1,500 lottery draw every afternoon. Employees would randomly draw a name in the system, and after announcing the name, the system would check if that employee had driven to work that day. If not, they would be the winner. If they had driven, sad music would play, and another name would be drawn. This way, those who missed the opportunity would feel regretful, and to avoid that regret, people would be more inclined not to drive to work. Interestingly, at the time, the Gates Foundation was hesitant to adopt this solution, fearing that employees might not be happy with it. However, another major company heard about this solution and was very interested. They proactively invited the author to experiment in their company. The author divided the employees into four groups. The first group received no incentive. The second group received $5 if they didn't drive that day. The third group participated in a weekly lottery draw where employees could write their names on unused parking tickets and put them in a box. The company would draw one ticket and reward that person with $500. As for the fourth group, they used the regret aversion lottery draw mentioned earlier. Everyone could participate, but if the drawn parking ticket had used written on it, the winner's qualification would be invalidated and another draw would take place. The result was that among the three groups with incentives, the group that received a direct $5 reward had the highest cost but the worst effect, reducing parking by only 10% compared to the group with no incentive. The lottery group performed better with a reduction of 18%, and the cost was also lower. The Regret Aversion Lottery Group had the best effect, reducing parking by 26%. In other words, leveraging people's regret aversion mentality can achieve greater incentive effects with lower costs. All right, above is the main content we discussed today. Finally, there's a little bonus. Today, we mainly talked about how to resolve common mixed signals in organizations and how to design more effective incentive measures. Throughout the discussion, our focus was on what organizations or managers can do. However, the advice on incentives we discussed earlier can also be applied to individuals. A typical example is using incentives to help oneself cultivate good habits. Regarding habit formation, I personally recommend a classic book, The Fog Behavior Model. We have also provided an audiobook summary for you. In that book, Fog actually covers the elements needed for habit formation comprehensively. Today's book, in my opinion, can be a beneficial supplement to that book. Fogg once said that the essence of behavior design is emotional design, and incentives are crucial for shaping emotions. Even a simple celebration after completing a task can send a signal of incentive to your brain. For example, saying to yourself, I did a great job immediately after doing 10 push-ups can provide a motivational signal. This book delves deeper into the topic of incentives. Some people may wonder if setting rewards for oneself from the beginning will lead to dependence. Will habits stop once the rewards are discontinued? As mentioned earlier, examples like incentivizing drivers to exercise and encouraging employees to drive less are discussed in the book. It's mentioned that even after incentives were stopped three or four months later, people still largely maintained good habits. Moreover, besides rewarding oneself, one can also use loss aversion to self-motivate. For instance, people nowadays often join groups like early riser group, early sleeper group, reading group, or fitness group. They check in daily, supervise each other and those who fail to meet the goals send red envelopes, digital cash, as a penalty. This method is effective because it fundamentally utilizes two typical principles of behavioral economics, loss aversion and commitment devices. If you can't find such a group, find a trusted friend to be your reading buddy or fitness buddy. You can make commitments, like doing 30 push-ups every day or reading for half an hour, and send them a red envelope if you fail. I personally use this method to encourage myself to sleep early, and the results were impressive. I only had to send a red envelope to my friend once throughout the entire commitment period. 
Additionally, the book also introduces a clever trick validated by scholars from Harvard University and other prestigious institutions called temptation bundling. It involves linking something you like with something you dislike. For example, the author himself only allows watching his favorite TV shows when exercising on the elliptical machine. This has two benefits. It alleviates the pain of doing something you don't want to do, enhancing the desire to exercise, and it pairs a somewhat indulgent behavior with a beneficial one, reducing the guilt associated with indulgence. We can adopt a similar approach. For instance, decide that you can listen to your favorite podcast only when you wake up, only listen to audiobooks while doing household chores, only watch a favorite variety show while eating a healthy meal, and only listen to your favorite playlist while running, and so on. All right. If you're interested in learning more fascinating knowledge about incentives, I highly recommend reading the original book or the ebook. The content related to personal habit formation is covered in the fifth part. So, that's it for today's discussion on this book. Please subscribe to the Tim Booker channel, like, and share this valuable knowledge with your friends. Let's combine wisdom and practice, achieve our financial goals, and create a better future together. Thank you, everyone, goodbye.